I always wondered how I was going to die, and now, now I know. Meru is the culmination of all I've done and all I've wanted to do is this peak in this climb. Conrad's reputation among climbers is flawless. I only go on expeditions with people that I know and that I trust. As a team, you're the sum total of all your experience. I had heard about Renan. I knew he was strong enough. When we got there and I looked up at the mountain, I didn't know what we were getting into. This is the test of the master climber. Jimmy and Conrad have climbed Everest four or five times. This is a whole different kind of climbing. 16 days up here. We lost half our food, and 90% of the mountain was still above us. The center of the universe is unattainable. Climbing with your mentors is a dangerous thing because you give them all of your trust. I gave them everything. Oh. Oh. The rewards of climbing are huge. The problem is you don't always come out of, okay, people die, and then you can't justify it. That is the great dilemma. The idea of not climbing was too much to imagine. I've got two kids, my wife's there, and I'm responsible for them. I had this premonition. I didn't want him to go. If we go for it, there's a probability that we aren't going to come back. Am I taking too many chances? Can I control the risk? Of course you can't control the risk. It was something that I had to do. It was Conrad saying, you can do this. He knew that we had to trust him, and that's what we did. We had become so close. It was worth the risk. It was worth possibly dying for. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, John, John, I want, I want to start with you. You know, uh, I've seen the film, and you play a major role in the film, sort of as this chronicler of uh, the history of, uh, of Conrad and, uh, and, uh, and of this trip. How did you, how did you know Conrad? How did you get involved in the film? I, I've, I've known Conrad, I think, since 1990 or 92. I was climbing El Capitan in Yosemite with an Irish guy I'd met in the bar. And uh, two other climbers came speeding up, and one of them, a blonde guy, clipped into my anchor, which isn't really good etiquette. And I was <laughs> pissed and was about to tell him to go fuck himself. And his partner came up, who was Mug Stump, who's also in this movie, who was Conrad's mentor at the time and was a good friend of mine. So I chilled and met him, and he was a great guy. And we've been good friends ever since. And I became involved in this movie because Jimmy tricked me <laughs> into getting involved. And I'm glad I did. I think it's a wonderful movie. What was the trick there, Jimmy? Well, I asked John. I was, you know, getting into the first edit. And I thought, well, who would be a better person than John to help with the story? Um, and, and maybe if he would take a look at, you know, what we had going on. And... So then I said, hey, John, do you mind coming over? And we're just going to shoot like a really quick interview. And I'm not sure how many interviews later and how many press events later this is, but um, that five-minute interview has taken up a lot of his time. <laughs> well, I think that says a lot about the film, that you've become so involved and you, you've, you've stepped up and sort of been a part of the press as well. You, you obviously really believe in this project. I, I think it's a wonderful film. Uh, I mean, I really, it really captures what climbing is about. And I think it's a, a really good time for it to come out because this Everest movie, this huge Everest movie is coming out next month um, and getting a lot, of, a lot of hype, a lot of attention. I haven't seen it. It might be great. Uh, uh, but the, the trailers are over the top. And, and that's a Hollywood movie shot in a soundstage with CGI. And this movie is the real thing. This is what climbing, this is the true soul of climbing, the spirit of climbing. Um, and it's, so it's a good counterpoint to the Everest movie. Sure, go see Everest, but then look at this. This is the real, this is what climbing really is. And it's about much more than just the physical act of climbing. This film is about the relationships between the climbers, the difficulty the climbers have 
justifying the risks to the people in their lives. It, the the, the, the non-climbing stuff is, to me, more powerful than even the climbing stuff, which you've seen. So It punctuates the climbing stuff very well. Yeah. Also, Chai, talk to me about, you know, you, you came on board after they had shot a lot of the, shot the, the bulk of the footage, right? And you came on board for the interviews and were working in the edit. And where did you find that this was going to be a story about teamwork, about friendship, and, and, and about brotherhood? and how climbing sort of tapped into that, rather than just a story of climbing. Well, the, the story about friendship and brotherhood is really at the heart of what they're doing. And it was just about, you know, looking at that a little bit more closely. But it's very true to the intentions of the climb. I mean, there's this whole story about how they attempted the first, in 2008, they fail, and then they return in 2011. But honoring that friendship and the bond between the three guys was so much about their motivation for the return. So it, it was just about mining what was already there. I think so many people would believe before watching the movie that the return is about the conquering of this, this, this mountain, this, 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 the shark's fin, right? But Jimmy, it's not necessarily about that at all. It's about your relationship with, with Conrad and Renan and sort of overcoming things that happened, not just the first climb, but in between. Yeah. Well, you know, Renan suffers a severe accident in, in between the two climbs, and, and I, uh, I get caught on a huge avalanche, and we're both kind of coming out of this, these really kind of horrible experiences um, and trying to get, put the pieces of our lives back together. And so, you know, the film does explore a lot of our different motivations, and, you know, we returned in 2011 and bring Renan because even though we knew that it might jeopardize our chances for the summit, but because, you know, we believed in him and we trusted him and, you know, that's a lot about, you know, what climbing is for, for me. And that's kind of part of the motivation with making the film was like taking a look at these different aspects of climbing that, you know, I, th I don't think the mainstream audience necessarily understands about climbing and, and that so much of it is about that partnership and that friendship. I think so much of it uh, is also about the time in between the action on the mountain, right? Like you have great footage of you guys climbing, but you're sort of, you were sort of limited to what you could shoot because you were also climbing while shooting. But you have this incredible footage of you guys in the tent. Uh, when you're like w in between your your climbs, right, or throughout the evening, where you're thinking about what's left, how much you could possibly do, whether or not you can do it, how your fellow man is is feeling at that time, was that something that when you went into shooting this, you knew that that would be something that would really punctuate the power of uh, of the story? I think, you know, as a good photojournalist or a good documentarian. Uh, when you first start out, you're always looking for the action and you're shooting the action and you get really obsessed with kind of getting the action. And, you know, as you evolve and grow as a storyteller, you realize that the best moments uh, are actually right before or right after the action. Uh, you know, I think of that when I'm shooting portraits. There's the, you know, you shoot the portrait, you get them all set up and they think you're shooting the portrait, but it's really that moment right afterwards. And uh, that you can catch something special or spontaneous. And, you know, when we went back in 2011 to film, and I had seen some of the footage from 2008, and, you know, I had also been filming on a lot of other projects, but it is those moments in between uh, where everybody's kind of thinks they're off camera, and, you know, there's just these moments where the face is speak more than any action or words. And so we went back and we, we did try to capture, you know, those uh, moments in between. Can we talk about where those moments are caught? Because I am obsessed with this, and you guys know that I am, with this tent that you sleep in in, in, in between climbs throughout the night. They sleep in tents. I don't know if any of you are climbers. I, I am not, but they're tents set up on the mountain that are, can you just talk about what, what, that, what those are? Yeah, it's, it's been hilarious, um, this whole process, because I've found how people are just completely fan, fascinated with our, our, it's called the portal ledge. And essentially, a portal ledge is a glorified cot that's hanging off of these straps. And uh, you basically 
you know, attach it to the wall, and then there's like a tent fly that hangs over it. And that's where you sleep, because Meru is too steep. There aren't any ledges to put up even a, a little tent. So you, you know, you, you hang off of these portal ledges. Uh, and they're actually very comfortable, and, and, and you can sleep really well in them. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> John, uh, John, talk to me. You know, you say you know Conrad for a long time. When did you first hear about, uh, about his uh, interest in climbing Maru? I don't remember. It was a long time ago because his mentor, and this is in the film, Muggs, who's an amazing person, very unusual guy, and this is Conrad's mentor. He was the one that got Conrad interested in this climb. It's just a totally, to Westerners, it's an obscure mountain. It's stunningly beautiful. The Hindus consider it the center of the universe. It's the headwaters of the Ganges River. It's this place where uh, heaven and hell and uh, and all come together, you know, on Earth. Um, and it, you, you just wrapping your mind around that. Uh, so it's this fascinating place, but it's not a mountain that most people have heard of, but it's beautiful, and it caught Muggs' eye, and he had a you know, picture of it, uh, and caught Conrad's eye, and Muggs tried and failed, and I don't know how many of the best climbers in the world, many, many attempts were made on this mountain, and everyone, no one came close to climb the fin itself. And with each failure, it became more and more desirable for this small subset of the world's top climbers, of whom Conrad and Jimmy are two. Um, so, you know, it was this kind of thing that no one, they didn't do it to get famous or rich. There's no money. There's n most of the world, you climb Mero, great. You know, I went, uh, you know, uh, I played tennis last weekend. To, you know, <laughs> that's how they, no one knows what it really means. But to them, and, and the climbers don't care that no one knows, but it just became this passion, this not rational, in their, you know, it was just it became this passion of Conrad's, and he infected Jimmy and Renan with it. Um, and it's an amazing story. It's all about kind of the nature of passion and the nature of teamwork and bonds and, and relationships and what you're willing to do. To, you know, to, you love your family and you love your life, but you get so taken by this p absurd passion that you're willing to sacrifice everything, risk your life. Um, and that, that's a fascinating thing to me. Um, well, you say it kind of in the trailer that when you, when you, when you, when it works and you climb the mountain, it's great. But if it doesn't work and something goes wrong, there's no justification for it. For, right. for those who don't climb, they don't understand the justification. No, it's true. And there's no justification for those of us who do climb. I mean, that's the paradox. <laughs> Even for climbers. Oh, no, no. It's, it's, you cannot, you know, risk is a wonderful thing. There's all the cliches about risk, about moving beyond your comfort zone and about, but risk is a wonderful thing. You know, a, a life of excess caution is, is in many ways as dangerous as a life of too much risk. I, I, and that's not a cliche. That's, if you live your life timidly, um, you know, that's a terrible way to live. It's just, what's a reasonable risk and what isn't? None of us can say. I mean, it's all, these guys cut it so fine, but they're really, really good at what they do. Uh, and Jimmy's still here, so he must have done something right, you know? I think um, also one thing that we learned from the film is that risk is a lot of times pensive. It's not necessarily like a point break style risk that we're talking about. We see you guys very thoughtfully climbing. It's not just like a, 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 an adrenaline junkies climb or anything. It's a very thoughtful, pensive experience for you guys. Right? No, this is, it's worth noting, and this is sort of the opposite of bungee jumping. I mean, climbing is not that. It's not this blind, I'm going to cast my fate to the winds and cross my fingers. Cl most climbers hate that kind of risk. It's all very calculated, and you've checked everything and dialed it. And, you know, that's what climbing's about. It's about sort of testing yourself. It's not about just closing your eyes and hoping you survive. Chai, I'm curious, you know, you, uh, you had this recent uh, op-ed in the, in, the, in the Times where you talked about how you met Jimmy in, in, in 2012, right, after the 2011 summit. So you knew he was a climber uh, when, you, when you guys started working together, when you got together, and then you start cutting this footage. You start seeing more and more his relationships to his teammates, to risk, to um, his, his loyalty, almost. How did the footage open your eyes even more uh, to Jimmy? Well, the footage really opened my eyes in terms of the motivations of their climb because when they returned in 2011, there have been several events that have transpired. Renan was in a terrible accident. Jimmy was in a very serious avalanche. And if their objective was solely 
to get to the top of the mountain. Bringing one on wasn't a sure thing. And so it's, the story reveals how it's almost, it's more important to honor the friendship between them than necessarily achieve their objective. And for me, that's always moving. And it wasn't at all what I thought mountain climbing was. It's not about conquering that, that peak. It's about this brotherhood. It's about the mentorship. It's about this friendship. And I just, I just had no idea. And so in terms of my, what, it, what I learned about Jimmy, I mean, I was impressed by that act of friendship. You it's know? about trust and reliance a lot of the times, too. You look at someone, you say, I trust, I rely on you. Don't let me down. <laughs> Literally, don't let me down. Um, talk to me about your, you know, you say climbing with your mentors can be difficult because, uh, I think, or Renan says it in the, in the trailer, right? Because you, you're putting a lot of trust and a lot of faith, and maybe sometimes you might be worried if saying that someone's doing something wrong. But Conrad was your mentor for a number of years before you even tried Maru the first time, right? Yes, I have been climbing with Conrad for 10 years uh, leading up to 2011. And, you know, I really owe much of my career as a, as a professional climber and as a photographer. Uh, I met him in 1999. I just finished my first expedition. And, he, you know, I said, hey, is it hard to shoot, you know, for the North Face or, you know, these other brands? And he just brought me along and... And little did I know at that time how much influence he would have on my life, but he, and it's, it's much easier to look at it in, in retrospect. When it's happening, you don't even really know it's happening. You're kind of just tagging along and, and trying to keep up with, you know, this guy who I grew up reading about and, you know, I had posters of this guy, you know, and so it, it's just been an incredible journey and Meru was this 20-year dream of his and uh, it just felt really special to, to take part in it with him and, to, and be able to be a part of it. And now, of course, with the film, you know, it, it's just very meaningful for me to be able to create a film that, you know, uh, speaks to his character. John, you know, you, you spoke a little bit about Maru and, 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 and why it is what it is and what it represents for climbers. And you mentioned Everest. And now I think for those who don't climb, they assume that Everest is the, the holy grail for, for, for climbers. Why is Maru that and, and Everest not so much? Everest stopped being the holy grail uh, a long time ago. It was, you know, throughout the first part of the 20th century and until its first ascent in 53 and through the 60s. But then... Uh, you know, it's, it's the highest mountain in the world, but it's not the most beautiful, the most technically difficult. And in the 90s, and I was part of this, uh, the, it began to be a business enterprise where if you had $65,000, $70,000 and were willing to take risks and endure misery, you, you could be led, led up. You didn't have to be a climber at all. And that's only, when I rode into thin air, I thought, and after that disaster, I thought, okay, this is gonna, people now are not, it's gonna end that, nip it in the bud. And it had the opposite effect. People would look at me and go, that guy climbed Everest? I can climb Everest, you know, if he did it, literally. And so now, you know, the problem is worse. So Everest isn't, Everest is a weird beast on its own. It's still the highest mountain in the world. I understand why people want to climb it. But you, you know, it's not really climbing. Climbing is about self-sufficiency and, and, you know, take decision making. And Everest, you know, you're led up the mountain by a guide and Sherpas do all the work and take, take most of the risks. And... That's not climbing. That's the opposite of what climbing's about. Um, this, you know, th there's a lot of other beautiful, hard mountains in the world. It's not like, the, you know, the last great problem's been solved and no one needs to climb anymore. But this was one of them. You know, this was this was a particularly challenging mountain that had withstood attempts by the best climbers in the world for a long time. Um, and this movie tells that story. And along the way, it explains, I hope, what climbing is really about, for better and worse. I mean, I'm. I'm a climber, it's still, I, I'm 61 years old and I still climb a lot, I'm embarrassed to say, but it's my- Why are you embarrassed to say that? That's well, incredible, he's 61 years old and he's climbing all the time, that's unbelievable. You know, because it's, you, when it feels like as an adult you should be doing something, <laughs> I don't know what, it's, but, but I still, I, I don't, you know, I don't really apologize for it, I love it, 
but it's not something I, I think everyone should do. It's like you don't get to pick what you become passionate about. You know, it, it chooses you, and you sort of you have a choice. You can follow your passion or not, and, and both come with costs. That's sort of a key lesson to this. You follow your passion, there's no guarantees. You know, death could end, and financial ruin, all kinds of things can happen, but I, there's this tragedy. If you, you know, you've got to do what inspires you. And some people, it doesn't, you know, they're inspired by just living, you know, simple life, simple pleasures. But some people aren't like that. And, um, and we're, we sort of suffer that from that. Jimmy and me and Chai, I would say, too, although not a climber. She's definitely she's a, a filmmaker, yeah, though, and, and I was actually going to say, I mean, how it's a, maybe it's a metaphorical stretch, but have you ever found that filmmaking is a little like climbing? You have a team that you rely on, that has to be a certain amount of loyalty to you, and finishing a movie can be kind of like getting up, feel like getting up to the top of a mountain. I mean, I think absolutely. I think there are also a lot of risks that film documentarians and filmmakers may take in the field, um, and you have to be driven by that passion. Financial risks, too. No, <laughs> it's huge, it's, I think both endeavors make very little money. I don't think you make much money climbing and nor making documentary films. <laughs> so, Jimmy, you know, you, you, you finish Maru, you, Conrad Renan, finish Maru. It's this massive, uh, I, I don't want to use the word achievement, but it's, it must be overwhelming to have done that. I mean, at one point, you know, you guys are, you're, you're, you're so excited and, you know, where did you, when did you decide that you had a film there? Yeah, well, actually just to address the first part of what you were talking about, um, you know, we, we, f we have some spectacular failures. I've had some spectacular failures in my career and I try not to dwell on those and I try not to dwell on the successes either. So uh, it's not like I finish this route and I wake up every morning and think, I climbed Meru, although I did do that for a little bit. Um, right, you tried, but, like, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there was a try. Yeah. But uh, you know, we, I went into 2008 on our first attempt and really was just filming for posterity. Uh, I've been filming and shooting expeditions and athletes and uh, you know climbers and skiers for over 15 years. So it's kind of part of my process of being in the mountains you know, there's the athletic side and then there's this creative side that I am equally passionate about. And, uh, but I, I wasn't thinking about a, a feature length film. And, you know. You're thinking that you'd have some video footage that you could show, maybe some photos here and there? Exactly. And I was shooting stills uh, for, I believe, Outside Magazine. And, you know, I was picking up some uh, video footage. And Renan and I were sharing the cameras. And, uh, you know, we got, we actually got. A few nice clips. And Renan has an editing credit on the film, right? I imagine yeah. he was a huge part of the development of the story. Yeah, absolutely. And, and shooting. You know, he's the first credit on the cinematography. And uh, we, you know, after 2008, we worked a lot together and we filmed a lot together. And then we went in 2011 and kind of the DSLR revolution happened. All of a sudden, you know, we had the capacity to shoot much more cinematic quality footage with the, a, what I used to just use as a still camera. And so we went in with the idea of like, we really wanted to elevate the shooting and uh, still hadn't thought about a feature film until essentially, you know, after 2011. And, you know, there's probably one moment when I was shooting Renan, uh, it's a late clip in the film um, where he's, you know, gives a pretty emotional kind of monologue about the state of, you know, his state of being at the time. And I, I remember putting down the camera and thinking, there might be something here that, that, that might be a great ending to a film. Now, when you're filming, this is kind of a silly question, but you guys are talking about losing toes. You're talking about, you know, freezing parts of your fingers off, but you're also still sometimes shooting how were you going about this when did you know when to stop did yeah. did you know when to stop where there were times where you were really pushing the limit on having a camera in your hands you yeah, filming up there is extremely challenging for a lot of obvious reasons i mean you have to be a climber first you're managing a lot of variables and thinking about safety and managing risks and making a lot of decisions but you know when you're up there uh and it's you know, negative 20 degrees out, and as much as you want to, you know, be working the dials with your gloves on, you can't. 
and you have to take your gloves off, and it might be snowing, and you're trying to focus the camera, or worse yet, switch cards out when your fingers feel like wooden, you know, fingers. Um, there's a lot of... I can't imagine switching cards I from know. a DSLR camera when freezing weather while I'm on top Completely of... Completely frozen, like they're like, you know, and, and the thing is, of course, if you drop anything, it doesn't hit the ground because there's no ground just below you. <laughs> if you, did you, did, did you at any point almost lose footage? Did you drop any cards or anything? No, I'm, I've been pretty good in my career. Um, I mean, it's, it's more than just the, you know, you can't drop anything. You can't drop a, a carabiner. I mean, everything you've brought up there has been pared down to the most essential, critical pieces of equipment. So actually everything is critical. You can't just not drop your camera, you can't drop a carabiner, you can't drop the stove or fuel or food, you know, so you're constantly hyper-conscious of, of dropping things. And actually, one of the nicest moments in a climb, after a climb, is when you actually get back down on the ground and you drop something on the ground, and it's this funny thing, because we'll all start laughing and we're throwing everything on the ground, and we're like, look, look, look. <laughs> And it's this hilarious moment, you know. I mean, you drop your harnesses, right? That's like the first yes, thing. Yes, yes. Like you take your harness pants. off, which is like <laughs> chafed you for like, you know, two, almost three weeks. And you finally get to take it off. And it drops to the ground by your feet. And it's a very happy moment. <laughs> I think we have some time for questions in the audience. Do we have one? So, John, you mentioned that climbers tend to be very calculated, and it is when they're uh, about to climb. Uh, but as far as avalanches, is there a way of preparing for that? And do you study the terrain to know which areas are more susceptible, or is it really unpredictable? Avalanches are one of the most dangerous part, dangerous things for climbers and skiers because, you know, I've taken avalanche. We've all there's science to it. There's forecasts. You dig snow pits and analyze snow crystals. We all do that. And the danger is you think you, you pretty, get pretty good at it. You learn when it slides and when it doesn't. And that's when, you know, you're going to get killed is because the mountain decides. Uh, and, um, you know, in the film, there's a couple of, a couple of the very dramatic moments in the film are about avalanches um, that killed uh, Conrad's, Conrad's friend and mentor. And Jimmy was in an avalanche. Uh, with the best snowboarders in the world, and it, he almost died. He's, it's a miracle he lives. So avalanches are one of those things about climbing and skiing that are especially dangerous because the risk, you know, in Miru, it's so steep, you're scared all the time. The, the danger is being, you're reminded of it constantly. You're dreaming of it. Avalanches is just, everything's peaceful and still and beautiful, and then it lets go. Literally, the mountain lets go, and you can't predict that. I mean, that's one of the things that is discussed in this film. I mean, we all try to assess risk and calculate it and, and you know, keep it, walk that fine line, but we're fooling ourselves. Um, we, you know, we're always getting away with it, uh, and sometimes you don't, and, um, and that's one of the things you wrestle with. There's moral questions. This is, a, this is a profound film. It's not like, it's not just this happy film. It, it raises all kinds of disturbing questions for which there's not always good answers. There's always a gray area. Life is always, it's never black and white. It's never you do something, you do more of it, it's good unless, you're always walking a tightrope. And this film for me makes me think about that. Not just about climb, but everything in life. Um, so forgive me for getting a little philosophical there, but um, there you go. Hi. Um, I know you talked about how mysterious um, the motivation for this is, but there must have been some very, very strong motivator considering that there was a possibility that you might not come back alive. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk more about what that was for you. Was it something intrapersonal or was, were you hoping that um, by accomplishing this you could spread the word more about what you do to educate people? I think there's a couple layers to uh, my answer to that. You know, I mean, certainly there's the part where it's, you know, it's my mentor's dream, and and I really wanted to be there for that, um, for him, but also for myself. And you know, when you have 
a craft or a passion, whether it's soccer or you know you're a musician. I mean, if if you're a soccer player, you wanna you wanna play pro. If you play pro, you wanna play in the World Cup, and if you play in the World Cup, you wanna win. And uh, if you're a musician, the same. You wanna if you have the talent and the capacity, you wanna take it as far as you can. And it's that same drive where you spend so much of your time refining this craft that you love, that's given you so much. And you know, you're given these opportunities to take it to another level and, and continue to push it. And, um, and you build your confidence towards doing that. And it's very similar, you know, and when you're faced with a mountain like this, and it's got this kind of history and legacy of failures. Uh, it's, it's kind of like your ultimate test. And that's a big part of the drive as well. Next question. Hi. Uh, my question's for uh, Jimmy. Uh, I'm an arm climber, so I'd like to know, what is the time frame from the moment you have this idea to you know, go up this mountain until you actually do and come down? Like, what are the stages, the preparation and stuff? Yeah, well, expeditions in general, I would give, you know, for a serious Himalayan expedition, it can be anywhere from six months to years. You know, you can, sometimes you have an idea that's percolating for years and years and years, and you know it's there, and it's been on your life list, and, you know, you, you kind of wait for the right team in the right moment to strike, but, you know, between saying, okay, next year I'm going to go and try to ski Makalu, you know, the fifth highest peak in the world. I'm not doing that. A bunch of my friends are leaving this week to do that, which is why I'm thinking of it. But, you know, it's... Thinking of it in what way? <laughs> is there a certain amount of... A bit somber about it? <laughs> well, I was asked to go, but I was like, I'm releasing a film that month. I don't think I can make it. Uh, but, you know, it'll take... It takes, obviously, years of experience if you are going to go do that to kind of build up to a point where you can. But from when a professional athlete says, okay, let's try to put this together, it can be a year, I think. You know, you have to raise the money. Um, you know, you've got to get all the equipment together. You've got to get your team committed. You train for it. Uh, and then, you know, the trip will last probably six to eight weeks, you know, uh, but door to door. For a Himalayan peak, you need six weeks. It's, it's oftentimes two weeks in uh, or 10 days in and 10 days out. You know, if you're doing a, a six-week trip, that only leaves you a month. And a month to acclimate to 8,000 meters is a fairly, you know, aggressive schedule. And you're, you're also balancing weather. It's not like you just get to choose when you go up and down. So you have to leave yourself a window. Um, Maybe a silly question, but I'm curious what the culture shock is like when you come back from a climb. Yeah, I'd imagine, well, I guess speaking from experience, yes. You know, when, you, when we came back from 2008, and this happens a lot, you come off of a really, really intense expedition. And I don't know if everybody does this, but it takes me a week of just hiding out in my house. And, you know, I'm just kind of trying to get my feet back on the ground because you go out it's hard to make small talk um, he eats he eats he eats a lot yeah. you binge i mean he, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, like, he gets like there's certain like, pies he likes to eat he's got a whole ritual of eating yeah cheeseburgers <laughs> well you, it probably takes a week it probably takes a week of time to eat all the things that you have been sitting in your tent dreaming about eating for six to eight weeks and I mean, it's a classic thing. It's like the hierarchy of needs. When you, when you first show up in an expedition, early in the expedition, you're talking about ex-girlfriends or sex or, you know, all these different things. And then as the, uh, you know, then you start talking about reading and then you start talking about, and then eventually it always goes to food. And you start talking about how you cooked this particular steak and how you garnish it with, you know, sauteed portobello mushrooms and everybody's sitting there, you know, staring at each other being like, oh yeah, go on, go on. It's 
Is there point. is there a certain amount of uh, I, I don't want to exaggerate it or anything, but is there a certain amount of PTSD when you come back hiding out because you don't know how to talk about it yet? You're a little sort of strung out because of it. Y you can be. I mean, it's hard to come back from like a really extreme trip, show up at a party, and this happens a lot. And you know, people come up, even people that you know that you don't mind having making small talk with. They're like, "Hey, what's up? How was that trip?" You know, and you're like, "Well, how do it, I explain <laughs> what I did to you <laughs> in yeah. small talk?" Yeah, it's. It's hard, but a lot of my friends know know me, and and a lot of my friends have been on expeditions. So, but um, there is a a bit of, you know, introversion. I guess you could call it happening. Reacclimating yourself to yeah. the regular world. Uh, do we have time for more questions? Uh, this one's for John. Uh, John, all the subjects of your work seem to be very intense. Do you think you'll ever get involved with something a little lighter? Some lighter fare, uh, for chance? I sure fucking hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that. Guys, I think that's all that we have the time for. How can people see? How can people see Maru? When's the next time? When? When can they see Maru? Maru is opening in theaters tomorrow. It's opening Fantastic. in New York, L.A. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's opening tomorrow in New York, LA, Boulder, Denver, Seattle, and Minneapolis, and then a national release to follow in the following weeks. So, and guys, you got to go see yeah. this movie. It's unbelievable. It's a really unbelievable experience sitting through what these guys went through. It's it's really incredible. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely.